In this video, we're gonna go over the best magic items that you can use that don't take up one of your limited attunement slots. These items won't be one-time consumables like potions or scrolls, but items that have permanent benefits like attunement items do. Kicking off this list at number 10, we have the Immovable Rod. The Immovable Rod is one of the classic utility magic items in D&D. It's a rod of iron with a button on one end. When the button is pressed, the rod magically fixes itself in place. Until the button is pressed again, the rod cannot be moved, defying gravity or any other force exerted on it. It can hold up to 8,000 pounds, and if it holds more than that, it will deactivate and fall. Similarly, a creature can make a DC 30 strength check to move it up to 10 feet, a nearly impossible feat for all but the most epic creatures and characters. Moving it that way does not deactivate it like the weight restriction does. There are many classic uses for the rod. The most common ones are preventing doors from being opened, using it as an impromptu parachute as to avoid a deadly fall, and fix into a place to stop a rapidly moving object. Examples of this include ships, wagons, charging cavalry, or, if you're incredibly daring, the inside of enormous creatures. With a bit of acrobatic effort, you can use it as a climbing tool, using it as an anchor to assist in climbing or to tie a rope to. If you have two of them, you can make an infinite ladder. If you knock someone unconscious and want a way to restrain them, put the rod on their back in a way where they can't reach the bottom with their hands. There are a lot of very creative ways to use an immovable rod. It is really just limited by your imagination. This is one of the quintessential utility items in D&D, which earns a spot on this list. Sneaking in at the number 9 spot, we have the Boots of Elven Kind. Is your party's paladin in their loud and clumsy heavy armor, always causing your party to fail stealth checks? Does your rogue constantly get caught when trying to sneak into places because they have chronic bad luck? Well, do I have an item for you. The boots of Elvenkind make the wearer's footstep produce no sound, and gives advantage on stealth checks whenever moving silently. Suddenly, your plate armor clad frontline party member isn't always failing at stealth, and your rogue is now almost always successful. Stealth is one of the most common challenges a party faces, and can be really awkward to overcome when it involves group checks. There are spells and abilities that can help you deal with most group stealth checks, but Boots of Elvenkind are a great solution that costs no resources or attunements. The lack of attunement means that even with a single pair, your party can give them to whoever needs them the most at that moment. Maybe the Paladin uses them typically, but the Rogue is going to go scout ahead, Well, you can just trade the boots for a little bit. No need to wait an hour to attune to them. The ability for anyone to use an item with the drop of a hat is one of the best parts of an item with no attunement, and the Boots of Elvenkind are one of the best examples of that utility in action. And at number 8, we have the Cape of Mountebank. This item gives you the ability to, as an action, cast the Dimension Door spell. Once you use this feature, it leaves behind a puff of smoke at your previous location and in the location you appear at, lightly obscuring those places. Once you use this feature, you can't use it again until the next dawn. This effect is pretty straightforward, and Dimension Door is an excellent movement spell to have in your back pocket. Teleportation is the best kind of movement as it doesn't incur any attack of opportunities and avoids any terrain or obstructions in your path and Dimension Door allows you to take another creature along with you, making this an excellent item for saving your friends as well. Due to the 500 foot range on Dimension Door, this item can single-handedly solve any movement speed issues a melee character might have in closing the gap on enemies at a distance, while other characters would love it as a get out of jail free card when in dangerous situations. Dimension Door is also a very common pickup when you get access to it at 4th level spells. So being able to use it through an item, even if only once a day, is a really nice value add. Every character can make use of this item and there's no limitations on who can use it, unlike many items that allow the user to cast spells. All of that and it's only a rare quality item, meaning you can realistically see it as early as tier 2 levels of play. This is just an all around great item. Speaking of an all around great item, next up at number 7 we have Carpets and Broom of Flying, which will be included together because they do basically the same thing, just in different forms. Both of them give the user a fly speed without an attunement, unlike the similar winged boots. The main advantage the boots have over the broom and carpet is that there's no weight limitation, as different sizes of carpets and broom both get slower depending on the weight it's carrying. One upside to the carpets and broom is that the broom and the smaller carpets are usually faster, granting 50 feet of fly speed for the broom or 80 feet for the smallest carpet, while the winged boots just give you fly speed equal to your normal movement speed. The carpets also have bigger sizes, allowing you to fly around more creatures so long as the carpet can accommodate their size and weight at the cost of speed. Flight is one of the best utility abilities in the game. Being able to get your Barbarian or Paladin in melee range of that nasty dragon without having to waste attunement or risk concentration on the fly spell can be game changing for a party. Larger carpets can bypass all sorts of traveling problems without needing to waste spell slots on things like Polymorph to fly from one place to another. Not to mention, even against non-flying enemies, flying movement is inherently superior as you can avoid difficult terrain and other obstacles as well. The speed increases grants most players also shouldn't be underestimated, often saving you from needing to use the dash action and allowing you to attack instead. These are staple magic items in D&D that nearly every character can find a great use for. 
Only something like an Aarakocra, which already has a 50 foot fly speed, might find these items superfluous. The level of high demand and high utility easily earn these items a spot on this list. And at number 6, we have the Bag of Holding. This also stands in for similar items like the Portable Hole or Hayward's Handy Haversack. All of these items functionally do the same thing create a magical pocket dimension in which you can store items without having to lug them around all the time. These items are essential for many parties, as in the vast majority of adventures there will be a plethora of objects you want to carry around with you, but they're either too heavy or too cumbersome to just lug around. Or as characters become more wealthy from their escapades, large sums of gold, silver, and copper can be similarly impossible to carry around without a little extra dimensional help. These items also serve the purpose of protecting valuable items. If there's a note or some other information you don't want to risk falling into the wrong hands or being accidentally seen, tossing it into a bag of holding where it can't be easily found is great. You can even smuggle living creatures through the portable hole or a bag of holding, though you need to do it quickly as they only have 10 minutes of air before they suffocate. Combining the items by shoving a portable hole or haversack into a bag of holding can open a rift to the astral plane that sucks in everything within 10 feet of the implosion. Not generally advisable, but sometimes you need to send something to another plane, and that's just one more feature of the items. The Bag of Holding and its related items are nearly synonymous with the D&D experience. Calling them staples really undersells just how much their existence shapes the way the game is played, allowing them to easily make this list. And at number 5, we have the plus 1, plus 2, and plus 3 equipments. This includes all standard weapons and armors and shields. Now, the advantage any of these items give you is obvious. They increase your armor class, chance to hit, and damage respectively, all without using up an attunement slot. But it's not just that they don't use an attunement slot that makes them good. Whereas a flat damage increase, like the iconic Flame Tongue's additional 2d6 fire damage might be more average damage if you compare them directly, that math changes a lot when things like Rage, Hunter's Mark, Fighting Styles, Great Weapon Master, Sharpshooter, or any other damage increase in ability, the more damage you already do, the better the chance to hit becomes. While there are a lot of magical weapons that a flat plus one would compete with, there are far fewer competitive options for magical armors and shields. Usually a plus one, two, or three armor or shield is some of the best equipment you can ask for on a character who can use them, with only a handful of options being comparable, most of which require attunement. Freeing up your character's attunement slots while not having to worry about being effective in combat is the main draw all the items on this list have. But even ignoring that, these items can be just as good or better than powerful attunement items of the same rarity. Next up at number 4, we have the Rod of Security. This allows you to, as an action, transport you and up to 199 other creatures to an extra planar space that forms in a paradise of your imagination. It contains enough food and water to sustain visitors, though anything from that plane that is taken outside of it disappears. Each hour spent there heals visitors as if they had expended one hit die. Visitors can remain in the paradise for a total of 200 days divided by the number of visitors. So if a typical party of 4 used it, the paradise would last up to 50 days. When the time runs out, or you intentionally end it, everyone appears where they were when the item was activated, or in the nearest unoccupied space. Once used, it needs 10 days to recharge. This effect is quite similar to the popular subcategory of very useful items like Leemid's Tiny Hut, or Morden Canaan's Magnificent Mansion. These spells are mostly used to create a safe area where a party can rest in an otherwise inhospitable environment. The big draw of the raw security over spells like these is that it doesn't require any spellcasting ability, ritual casting, or spell slots, and most importantly, it only takes an action to use. This makes the rod an unmatched escape tool, and even the most dire of situations you can just plane shift your entire party to not just a safe place, but a place that actively heals you throughout your stay. For roleplaying purposes, having a magical paradise you can use to impress NPCs has its benefits. It's even more secure than the likes of Leomid's Tiny Hut or Morden Canaan's Magnificent Mansion because it doesn't leave a presence behind that can actively be dispelled or investigated. The Rod of Security just does what the name implies, provides you and your team with all the safety and security you could possibly want. Just don't let the person carrying the item get knocked out first. And at number 3 on this list we have the Horns of Valhalla. The Horns are a series of four different horns, each progressing in rarity and power. Each horn has the same basic function of summoning a number of berserkers within 60 feet of you when you use your action to blow on the horn. The silver horn is the weakest and only summons 2d4 plus 2 berserkers, but it has no restrictions. Next is the brass horn, which summons 3d4 plus 4 berserkers and requires proficiency with simple weapons to use. Then there's the bronze horn, which summons 4d4 plus 4 berserkers and requires medium armor proficiency to use. Finally, the most powerful horn is the iron horn, which summons 5d4 plus 5 berserkers and requires proficiency with all martial weapons to use. In each case, the Berserker lasts for one hour or until they're reduced to zero hit points. One of the best ways to break combat in D&D is creating a horde of monsters your enemies have to chew through to win the fight, and this item does that quite well. One of the downsides of most summoning spells is the need for concentration, but the Horn of Valhalla has no such limitation. 
The only real downside to such a great item is that you can only use it once every 7 days, meaning you're going to want to save the horn for a big fight or a series of consecutive battles that you can squeeze into a 1 hour duration. The Berserkers are CR2 creatures and each have 67 hit points, the ability to attack with advantage, and deal a respectable 1d12 plus 3 damage. They're a bit beefier than most mid-level summon spells, but once you get to higher levels their value decreases as a couple of poorly placed fireballs could wipe them all out. Worst case scenario, you summon 4 Berserkers of the Horn, but that is still an excellent use of your action. But the average roll is somewhere between 7 and 17 depending on the Horde you use. The potential damage output of this item is quite high, despite requiring no attunement. And at number 2, we have the Manuals and Tomes. These are a series of 6 different magic items corresponding to one of the core ability scores. The 3 manuals apply the 3 physical ability scores of Strength, Dexterity, and Constitution, while the three tomes are for the three mental ability scores of intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. They all state that you may spend 48 hours over the course of six days reading the book's contents, and should that go off without a hitch, you gain plus two to the respective ability score permanently. The most important thing about these items is that this particular plus two to your score can raise your ability scores beyond the usual maximum of what is usually supposed to be 20. Once you've used the item, it loses its magic until a century has passed. There aren't a lot of ways to raise your ability scores outside of racial bonuses and using your ability score improvements as you level up. There's only a handful of items that directly affect your ability scores, and they all require attunement. There are no classes in the game which turn down the offer of additional stats. All characters can use additional constitution. Dexterity helps with a number of checks and saves. Martial classes can get a plus one to hit with additional strength. Wisdom is the required save for most spells that cause you to lose control of your character, so who wouldn't want some extra charisma to talk to an NPC better? And of course there isn't an artifice or a wizard on earth that would turn down some extra intelligence. A party can never have enough manuals and tomes, as every character gets better with bigger stats. Just be careful as a DM, if you hound out one or two of these you could cause infighting as your players bicker about who should be allowed to use them. In my current game, the artificer found a tome of clear thought, but rolled really high on a stealth of hand check, allowing him to hide it from the wizards. But if he hadn't rolled so well, that could have become an in-character fight. These books are some of the strongest items in the game, and easily sail away the number 2 spot. And they could have been number 1 if it wasn't for the fact that, at the number 1 spot, we have the Ring of Three Wishes. This is a legendary ring which comes with between 1 and 3 charges, and you can use an action to cast the spell Wish. And once all the charges are used, the ring becomes a non-magical item. Wish is the best spell in the game, and we've talked about it and this item a number of times in other videos with good reason. With this ring, you can cast Wish up to 3 times. I say up to because it is up to your DM how many charges he wants to let you have, but getting even one charge can be totally game changing. Now it's not without the downsides casting wish normally comes with. Bigger wishes are more likely to monkey paw, and there's the weakening side effects when you use it for any purposes besides emulating other spells. You need to take a long rest after casting, otherwise each time you cast a spell afterwards you take 1d10 necrotic damage for each spell level, so make sure you get that long rest. On top of that, there's a 1 in 3 chance each time you cast Wish that you can never cast it again, which would also mean you cannot cast it through this ring without any additional charges. But all that can be avoided if you just restrict yourself to casting spells of 8th level or lower, as even just that ability makes this one of the best items in the game. It's hard to really quantify just how much Wish can do for a character in any campaign. If you ignore the infinite versatility that 3 Wishes can grant you, the reason it's easy to take number 1 spot on this list is because you could reasonably wish for any other item on this list, and still have two wishes left over for either you or your allies if you fail the one in three. When it comes to non-attunement magic items, there is nothing comparable to a ring of three wishes. Though be careful when you use it, most dungeon masters are just waiting to twist your words to suit them instead of you. Alright, and that's the list. Are there any items I've missed that you think should be included on this list? Or do you have any ideas for other future topics you'd like me to cover? If so, leave those suggestions down in the comments below. 